All right, I'm going to give you a few minutes to write down the host range here. Um, there's a lot, and this is, of course, only a partial list. Yeah. 545 known plant species, probably more than that since this paper was written in 2011. 363 genera, 121 families. So this is, was uh, what I referred to earlier about this paper that had uh, proclaimed that light brown apple moth was the most polyphagous insect known to man. Herbaceous plants are prefer preferred over woody plants, although you'll see in some subsequent slides, woody plants can also be um, a host. Uh, many weeds, uh, many ornamentals in the landscape, around the homes, or those pet plants that you have growing around the nursery or uh, for shelter belts or for uh, buffer areas that you might have on perimeter areas, those can all be um, hosts. Um, this, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if there's an updated um, host range of the top detections, but this is if not, um, I was thinking, I, I actually, I added this slide yesterday, and I'm thinking maybe we need to do that, Rick, um, possibly, or someone with C CDFA, to update um, this, the most common detections. I think, it, it's, I think it's useful. Um, so this goes back to 2007 when it was first discovered to 2011. Most of the detections were the Monterey Bay here and also in the San Francisco Bay Area. So um, you'll see a lot of plants there that are associated with the hosts that we actually produce up there. My suspicion is that that host range, as we discover more down in San Diego and other places, uh, your host range is gonna be different because of course you're growing different, different plants. But you see a lot of blackberries and raspberries were found. Alstroemeria, for whatever reason, it's, it's just a wonderful host. Uh, Mirica californica, um, it's a coastal native plant that's grown um, quite commonly for, um, for uh, landscapes and that in, in my area. Uh, and is a wonderful host, it turned out that, I mean, we use that in our research for um, the insecticide research. It's, it makes a, a, a great host to raise LBAM. Uh, strawberries, roses continually uh, are a, a great host. I think anything that is producing um, those, those leaves that are capable of being bent and folded into structures, into these shelters, and that could be a, a good host. And the longer that those leaves are being produced, I think the better the host it is. Um, in San Diego, I guess everything grows all the time, so I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I think it's just gonna be really great conditions. What we're finding is that in, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, but in probably what is happening in these perimeter host areas in the natural wildlands is that LBAM is jumping from one host to another. So, you know, one host in the north maybe goes dormant and another one starts to grow. And it's, the, the, the moth is migrating to those new hosts, happens to lay eggs on it, and it's capable of, of developing on it. So there's a kind of hip, hip um, hopscotching around on desirable hosts. So anyway, there's a, there's a list of the common ones. Again, something to be a lookout for, but maybe you're gonna have different hosts. And then you have the hosts that are defined by regulation, which are a lot. It's all nursery stock, cut flowers and greens, fresh garlands, wreaths, and all harvested fruits and vegetables with some exceptions. So if you, the exceptions are those that are listed on the CDFA website. 
at CDFA, LBAM, you'll find a list. There are various um, cool season vegetables on there, artichokes, broccoli, lettuce, um, uh, some fruit uh, like citrus I, I think is exempted. But anyway, the entire uh, list is there. Right now though, all ornamentals are uh, regulated. Um, okay, so, so I laid out that picture of lots of, lots of capability to develop on a lot of different hosts here, no diapause, that kind of a developmental range that's perfect for coastal California. Um, it's really hard to control LBAM within the nursery in our area, in the Monterey Bay. And, some, and that, a lot of that has to do with uh, our nurseries are commonly surrounded by native vegetation, riparian areas, so we have a stream running down here. We have homes that are situated here with landscapes that are, of course have no control of LBAM at all. And in um, 2010, this is just an example of where the detection, the USDA uh, CDFA detections were in this particular uh, six acre nursery. All the finds between this period of March to September were found in this starred areas and you look at where they're associated with along these perimeters. So we suspect, you know, that no matter what this grower was doing, he was spraying as regulatory treatments were requiring him. He had pheromone mating disruption going on. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But he still had these fines, these official fines. Here's, I had an opportunity um, about, um, it was 2011, 2012 sometime, to go out to a, a quarantine raspberry field in North Monterey County. Oops, sorry. And uh, this was a one acre raspberry field, so 200 feet wide. We divided it into uh, sections. Uh, three sections, one in the middle section and a perimeter section. Here was a, uh, a, a perennial creek running along this side, and here was some native vegetation over here. I think that was a strawberry field here. Native vegetation, weeds, wild raspberries, uh, um, I'm sorry, wild blackberries, um, both the invasive and the native were in this, was in this area. And I'm not sure if you can see this uh, here. Can you see these numbers here, seven and two? I'm not even sure. Or is it seven and three? I'm not even sure if I can see it. Um, but it's set, it's the, you have some numbers that are in red, and those are the number of leaf rolls that we detected when we walked these rows. And then the, in the blue are the number of actual larvae that we found within those leaf rolls. So the red is the number of leaf rolls, the, the, the blue is the, the number of larvae. And if you can see that there's a lot more leaf rolls in section one and in section three than in all of section two, zero, zero, one, two, one, two, zero, 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 zero. So here's a case where we have these perimeter hosts that possibly was a source of LBAM uh, migrating in and laying eggs and, and possibly even reproducing um, and completing life cycles in, in this area. And if you look at the research that was done in um, New Zealand that actually tagged light brown apple moth. I don't know how they, how they do it, but they tag the light brown apple moth, release it, and then they watch where, where it flies and how far it flies. And I think it was done in an apple orchard, so it was all a contiguous 
very uniform apple orchard. And then they, they, found, they monitored that. And so what they determined is that the majority of moths that were captured from those releases were found within really the 100 meters of the release. There were, however, moths that were found all the way out to 600 meters, though, but infrequently. But the majority can fly for about 100 meters, or think of it as 300, 300, or, um, 300 yards, right? And so that type of graph really got me thinking about our situation at least in the Monterey Bay region and many other nurseries, maybe including San Diego County. But we have these areas, as I had illustrated early, that are just adjacent to our production areas that we have no control of, we have no management practices, and could be a source of light-bound apple moth that really is a hop, skip, and in this case, almost a jump across a road to the production area. Not, a hundred meters is, you know, for a moth, a hundred meters, they'd go all the way across the whole nursery in a hundred meters. Here, it's an obvious thing where if this vegetation become, becomes unsuitable for the light brown apple moth, why doesn't it just migrate over to an area that's being watered and fertilized and has multiple potential hosts? So, because of that, um, I asked what, you know, not only, you know, is the, is the proximity an obvious problem, but are there certain LBAM hosts that we have to really be careful of? Are there higher risk LBAM hosts that possibly we could um, eradicate or weed or maybe target in our scouting to determine whether they were higher risk? And that was that was part of a research that um, we had developed, um, which I'm gonna talk about now. Anyway, I'll see if I can keep my voice going here. It was an early morning for me today because I flew down. Um, so, what we did is um, develop a scouting program where we monitored uh, uh, in five different regions around the Watsonville area. So North Monterey County, uh, around Watsonville, both coastal and inland, and then also up in uh, region one was in the Soquel area, so just south of Santa Cruz for you, for you that uh, know that area. And we wanted to look at the population dynamics, so in other words, whether populations were rising or falling, what time of the year that was, and we, we also uh, looked at the hosts, not within the nursery, but outside the nursery in these perimeter uh, areas where we could find um, vegetation. We looked at eight different nurseries that we compiled in these five different regions. And we looked at that between o October 2011 to, to July 2014. And so I, I no longer have that program going on. So. If you go to my website again, you'll see kind of the latest results because we were putting this up on our website every two weeks as we were gaining the information. So I no longer have that research program. We're no longer doing this. But every two weeks, we were monitoring. We were monitoring with two types of traps out in those perimeters. We used the Jackson trap, which is the same trap that the USDA and CDFA uses for the perimeter and for your nurseries when they're monitoring uh, a nursery. And this, this trap has a synthetic pheromone that's specific to light brown apple moth, and it attracts the male light brown apple moth. It basically imitates the female moth. There's two little molecules that is produced and this particular ratio, these two molecules, mimics the female, and the males are attracted to it, and they're inside that Jackson trap is a sticky card, and the moth, the male moth, is stuck to it. So it's very specific. The other thing that we developed 
was a bucket trap. And, we, and this had some liquid attractant baits, and I'll go into that in just a second. First, the pheromone traps. This is what this uh, Jackson trap looks like. Uh, you might see this in your nursery. You can also purchase these for your own use in your nursery. And I actually recommend that you do so that you have your own idea uh, what, what's going on potentially in your nursery or just on the outside of your nursery um, if you start getting um, into this problem. Uh, this is the type of uh, thing that you might see when you pull the insert out. You, you could see some light brown apple moth males, but you might see some other junk in there. But uh, for the most part, a lot, you know, if you have a lot of light brown apple moth, you will see the apple moth in there. And sometimes you'll have something come in there just by happenstance, by probability, something is flying in. Uh, and uh, or migrating in and just happens to get stuck there. <clears throat> this other trap that we developed uh, was a bucket trap and it had this um, fruity, sugary uh, liquid in there, a terpenal acetate, which is a food grade um, fruity uh, substance, uh, it's, um, and brown sugar. Um, and um, we found that by comparing this with the pheromone trap that we could detect both male and female moss in this type of trap. The only problem is, is that we usually trapped about 10% less than the synthetic pheromone would trap. But not too bad, actually. 10% is not too bad, especially when you could detect uh, female moss. Um, this formula and how to make this trap is available on my website also. Exactly how to go step by step how to make this trap. Um, so again, on this, to continue to describe how we monitored, we looked just as a scout would look for hosts, symptoms, like the leaf rolls, in this case, on French broom which is an invasive uh, plant that we have in central northern California and may maybe even down here. I'm not sure. French broom? Does that ring a bell? No. So I think mostly central to, to northern California, all, all the way up into Oregon. Very highly invasive in along roadsides, disturbed areas. But this is what the scout would look for was a, a leaf roll and then if he found the leaf roll, he'd pull it open. If it was a suspect leaf, leaf roll, we took that leaf roll with some of the associated leaves, brought it back to our lab um, under permit, US CDFA permit, by the way, <laughs> uh, and uh, raised it in an incubator and, did, and raised out pupa stage, adult stage, and then we were positively able to identify it as a light brown apple moth through morphological features of the adult. So even we could do that. We didn't have to send the larva up to CDFA to have Mark Epstein and others to identify it. We could identify it ourselves as the adult. So that's how we confirmed that the, the host was indeed a true host of light brown apple moth. Um, this is an example of a monitoring plan of a, of a uh, nursery, in this case, a cut flower nursery in North Monterey County. Um, the purple, which you may or may not see, is the perimeter of, the, of this nursery. Um, and we had various zones that we identified here, zone one through six in this case, which were 100 meter um, um, uh, areas, 100 meter length areas, and we identified plants on either side of that 100 meter length. Um, that's that's kind of what, so we identified that as a scouting area, and every two weeks identified any type of hosts that were in those particular areas. In each of the zone, we had those terpenal brown sugar um, bucket traps and the pheromone bucket traps. 
So a little bit about the results. Um, here is the results to uh, March 2014. Um, here's the most common host that we saw. Again, public land enemy number one was that invasive pa uh, plant, French broom. And then the second was coyote bush, or uh, commonly known as Bacris also. That's Bacris is the genus. And then we had various uh, wheat, common weeds, dovefoot geranium, wild radish, buckhorn plantain, horseweed, fireweed, curly dock. Uh, worked all the way down, vinca, uh, smartweed. And then down even to coast live oak, unfortunately. We found it on coast live oak. Um, common uh, uh, tree that is found in in our area, in the Central Valley. Uh, how, now I say that though, it was only found in the springtime when you had that young flush of growth. Later on, I think what happens there, and ha we, we should really confirm this, but what I think is happening is that those leaves harden up. They're not very conducive to light brown apple moth. And when you look at oaks, there's a lot of spiders and a lot of other possible predators and parasitoids that are out there. I think those are being taken care of. So I, I would say that um, coast live oak may be a host, but it's not a really good one in, in, our, in our situation in the Monterey Bay. So anyway, this all, all the way, okay, um, Him Himalayan blackberry, which is the invasive blackberry that we have up there. But, and it continues, you know. So I think there were a thir um, 30, 34 different hosts that we had identified. So looking at population dynamics that were determined in those uh, bucket traps and also the pheromone traps, this is just two of uh, the sites, two of the eight sites, just to give you as an example, but we have um, actually, I have all eight sites on the website uh, for you to see, but uh, it gives you an example of, um, of the population dynamics. So here's that September period, 2011, all the way out to February of 2014. Um, and you see this ups and downs here. Um, I think um, there are some trends where we see uh, a, a, a peak in this October, November period, October, November period, October, November period. So that's maybe a, a, a trend uh, of finding migrated moths. Um, we also, and it's not illustrated too greatly here, but we also see a general reduction of the number of finds in not only our traps, but also on the number of hosts as the drought continued on. We had this drought that started you know, four years ago and of course continued, and we found that a lot of those hosts were, were more hardened and of course not doing as well, and apparently light brown apple moth was not doing as well also. Now that I said that, though, we also have higher number of degree days, too, that are pushing those life cycles a little bit faster, too. So you're probably having that compete, too, with this general decline of uh, the availability of apple moth in these uh, various perimeter hosts. Uh, here's another graph now showing the number of larval finds in those perimeter hosts. And I think one of the things that's uh, obvious, along with the number of moth finds, is that we're finding larvae really all during the whole year in the Monterey Bay, all through any time of the year. Um, maybe higher numbers in the springtime, but I think that's probably because in the springtime we have more conducive growth to the establishment and the finding, the detection of light brown apple moth. In other words, there's a lot more succulent growth out there for us to look at and for the apple moth to
to use as shelters. So we're probably finding more. But certainly, any time of the year, we're finding larvae out there. So a little bit, a little general concept about uh, scouting, um, principle of scouting, I think, in this case, and then maybe a little bit more specifics about um, light brown apple moss scouting. But I show this slide in other, um, in other talks about scouting because it, it brings to mind a meeting that we had in my office in Cooperative Extension in Watsonville some time ago where there was a lot of bad stuff going on in the community. And we had around our neighborhood, basically, around our office. And we had the local Pol Watsonville Police Department come in and talk to us about what we should be looking out for, you know, at night or whatever around our building. And I, we asked the question, well, you know, how, how do you patrol the city of Watsonville? How do you find the bad guys? And this corporal said, I'll never forget that, he said, target the known problem areas, but make sure you cover the entire town. And, you know, with my crazy mind, I'm thinking, well, that's what you do in scouting, right? Is that really, and especially, I think, with light brown apple moth, because of its wide host range, you know, anything can be a potential host. So cover the entire town, but then you'll figure out, and you may figure out pretty quickly, unfortunately, which are the most preferred hosts. Um, and we can give you some ideas what are the preferred hosts are now, but you'll probably find out yourself in your particular case. So intensify the scouting in those preferred hosts, I would say. Um, okay. So you can use those LBAM pheromone traps or the bait bucket traps to help you determine um, the population dy dynamics. And uh, you can determine those peak flights potentially. You can increase scouting intensity to um, up to every week if you, if you need to. Um, if, if, uh, you know, if you see some peaks in the flights, you know that there's a higher risk of migration, and therefore you have more egg laying going on in the crop, and therefore you know that you're gonna to have to be looking for the young, younger larva. It's good to detect LBAM at the young larval stages because, for various reasons. Um, first because, um, and primarily is because they're more easily controlled at the younger stages. Uh, you can use something like Bacillus thuringiensis, while if you find a fifth or sixth instar stage, those big fat ones that can pull big leaves together, those aren't going to be controlled by Bt. Um, it's just better to get, uh, get right on top of it. So the earlier you detect these larvae, the better. Uh, you can monitor these higher risk hosts that we've identified around the perimeter, if, if those exist. And I think what I've learned from our, my growers up in the Monterey Bay area is that they've learned to really train their workers and to actually reward their workers for detecting light brown apple moth. So there can be a financial award. Um, has, uh, there, you know, there can be some type of incentive to find and detect and to make note so that, there, that the pest management can be um, applied when necessary and early. And then the other thing that I've seen also are these scouting teams that are formed. I alluded to that, where a team is formed just before um, the, official, the, the, the officials come in to do the inspections, and this is an intense in, uh, uh, intense inspection of the high-risk hosts. Um, and so I've seen them go through, you know, almost row by row, three or four of their own scouts going through and really taking their time. And I've seen some with um, sticks that will actually push the, pull the, or hit the plant to see if you can get any adult to, to come out. But I think a lot of it is having really good eyesight, a keen eyesight, and train your workers for the detection of the symptoms, the leaf rolls, and to be able to 
pull off the leaf roll, capture it, and then s s make sure that um, it is uh, identified um, properly and that the appropriate uh, actions are taken. Okay, let me take a sip of water here. Anything on that? All right. One of the neat things I think about this is that we've learned from um, some of the biologists, particularly uh, Nick Mills up at UC Berkeley, is that there and his graduate student um, actually, um, is that there are numerous uh, natural parasitoids, so little wasps and predators and that that can attack light brown apple moth. And they just published, Burgey and Mills in 2014, a study that they did where they found various egg parasitoids, larval parasitoids, that were attacking light brown apple moth. And in that study, they uh, looked at the um, parasitism in the spring and then in the summer. Looks like parasitism was higher in the summer and fall. Um, there was higher parasitism, parasitism on plants uh, that were in the Australian, um, from Australian type plants than in non-Australian plants, so I think that's pretty interesting. But I think overall, um, the uh, overall parasitism was really quite remarkably high here. Um, so up to 40% um, uh, in the summer and fall and it looks like uh, over 30% in the spring were parasitized by these naturally occurring insects. So, it, I mean, it really tells me to, uh, if in the, in the ideal situation, we would be making the best use of that. We wouldn't be spraying the whole nursery with broad spectrum insecticides. We would allow these parasitoids and that to help us out in the perimeter areas and then also into the, in the nursery kind of like what we've been doing in the past. So this is, you know, this broad application of insecticide is blowing, um, you know, kind of IPM out of the, out of the, you know, out of the window.